Thank you for joining us. Welcome to tonight's financial aid event for juniors and their parents or guardians. I'm very excited that you are able to attend and hope the presentation is informative. I know that we may have some folks joining us from the Putney School tonight, so I'll take a moment to introduce myself. I am Nick Sudik, the Director of College Counseling at Pingree School. Tonight's presentation will focus on eligibility for financial aid, maximizing discounts, and the coming changes to the FAFSA this year, along with some other nuts and bolts information for business owners and separated households. Even with generous financial aid packages, college remains a pricey investment. Tonight, we have brought in specialists to help clarify the process of applying for financial aid. I am delighted to introduce Matt Carpenter and Peg Keough, our presenters for the evening. Matt is the founder and chief revenue officer at College Aid Pro. He has successfully guided tens of thousands of families through the college financial aid maze and has no plans of slowing down until his mission is fulfilled. Peg is director of education at College Aid Pro and a recognized thought leader and a frequent speaker at schools and organizations. College Aid Pro, Matt and Peg's company is an online tool that helps families find affordable options for higher ed. The platform exists in both free and paid versions, and I am super excited that we are able to provide the premium paid version to Ping Pingree families at no charge. If you're unsure how to access the premium version, we will send out the coupon code when we share the recording of tonight's presentation. We hope this additional tool helps Pingree students identify colleges that will be a strong financial fit for them. Additionally, by connecting with Matt and Peg on tonight's presentation, we can offer some strategies about applying for financial aid and help to bring down the cost of higher education. Welcome, Matt and Peg, and thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, always a pleasure. Uh, happy to, and, and, and welcome. Nice to meet all you uh, past 2024 um, families, right? I think I think we had a, a, a good amount of success guiding your your buddies in the class of 2023. So we're looking forward to kind of starting at the very beginning. We got a little bit of a late start last year. So hopefully that's an advantage for you all and that we can kind of be here at the foundation. Uh, again, once it, my name is Matt Carpenter. I'm actually a I'm a local boy here, North Shore, born and, born and raised. I grew up in Ipswich, went to Ipswich High, went to Stonehill College locally. I live in Beverly now and at our offices here in Salem. Peggy's, I brought in the big guns. We bring in the big guns for, for our, our local schools here, joining us from, from out in Seattle. But uh, yeah, this is actually my 19th year guiding families through this process. So I, I, I like to think, I'm sure I haven't seen it all, but I've seen I got a, a a pretty good sample size of uh, any dynamic you can think of. We've worked with any college you've heard of, I have to imagine. Um, and we like to, this has been a lot of our talk track recently, kind of internally, is really trying to think of ourselves as just a, a shepherd, a North Star, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I think a ton of the feedback we get from families, especially at this kind of beginning stage of the process is like, where do we start, right? How are we going to pull this off? You hear so many different pieces of information and, and, you know, from your neighbors, your buddies, the media, whatever, it's hard to know how it's going to work for your family, right? And that's kind of our goal of you're in great hands here, right? And you're, you're especially and hopefully um, as you guys dive into the platform itself, I think we'll become very appreciative that Pingree made the investment uh, so that you all have access to that. And, uh, you know, in addition to the education that, that we'll be providing I think at really every pain point of, of this process. So tonight's kind of the foundation, but anyways, this is what we love to do, right? We just finished one cool roller coaster ride. We just get back, get back to our front of the line and here we go. Let's ride it again. Right. And, and that's what it is, right? Mostly fun, but we got some scary parts here too. Right. So, um, but again, I, I, I think you're in good hands here and, and we're excited to, to prove that to you all. And, you know, tonight in kind of every step along the way here, I think, I really encourage you to take advantage of, ask us the questions that are keeping you up at night, right? What are you talking about at home that's really at, at the forefront here? And, and the, one of the nice parts about doing this thing virtually, you can do it completely anonymous, right? So just write into the Q&A, hey, here, whatever it is, okay? And um, by design, we always try to have two of us speaking so one of us can be in the Q&A. So again, please take advantage of that. 
Um, and, and for those of you that got to dip early and for your friends that couldn't make it, we'll get you the recording. We'll get you the slide deck tomorrow. Uh, and, and Nick, we'll take a minute or two to talk about for those of you that haven't set up your account yet, or if you're having any trouble, we'll make sure that we uh, kind of spoon feed that to you. But without further ado, here's my partner in crime. This is Peggy Keogh, again, all the way out from Seattle. Peggy, someone that I've, I've just been a fan of for years uh, and, and courted her patiently or impatiently for a lot of years to try to figure out a way to make her officially part of our team and was very excited to finally make that happen a couple of years ago. Um, and I think uh, uh, in addition to her kind of professional credentials, you know, she's she's done this twice over, right? She sent her twin kids off to college uh, many moons ago, right, Peg? Like a, a couple of decades ago now, but... Um, okay, I'm not that old, but it's been a few, it's been a little while. But I've been I've been on the journey and uh, you just some days you need a lot of deep breaths, but you'll make it. And and honestly, being here and just learning what you're going to learn tonight is like a ginormous first step, because if you're an informed consumer in this process and understand how it works and have that knowledge, it's just it's so much easier than what I, I say. And you know, a lot of parents just drift. It's it's scary. You have so much on your plate already. And, you know, we can guide you. As Matt said, we know the journey you're, you're on and we understand where it gets tough and we've got the education and we've got the software and, you know, um, Pingree's paying for it. So it's awesome. You, you can get in there and very user-friendly and we'll be in there tonight. So you get to see it and you start to see how it works. And so definitely use it and definitely jump on our webinars because we will walk you through all these steps. All right, let me share my screen and we can get going here. So as Nick said, we're from College A Pro. That's who we are. And, and truly, this is our mission to end the student debt crisis by empowering you to shop smarter. And all that means is we're educating you, helping you understand financial aid and then where you fit, because that's what's really important. And it, it's going to be different from school to school. And you're going to see that when we show you some examples. So there we are. Okay, so you should have gotten an email earlier today um, encouraging you to set up your account. You have that coupon code that Nick referenced. So if you have any questions when we're in there, we'll actually show you so we can get you set up. But that you see the, the URL right there and Matt can pop it in the chat as well. Um, so if you want to go and set it up real quick, you're going to pick the scholar option, which is the middle one. When after you create your username and password, you'll see there's three columns, free scholar, valedictorian, pick scholar, put in your code, the code will back out the charge. And then you can get in at, at answer a few onboarding questions and then you'll be it. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy. And what's cool is you'll be able as as we're teaching you some of this stuff I'm about to show you you'll actually see it for your family and then you'll see the sample family that that Matt and I are going to put up there. And I so put it I put it in the chat. Yeah, I put the link in the chat and then again your coupon code is pingree24. So again, you'll okay. you'll find it in the chat but Okay, great. All right. So what is financial aid? How does this whole thing work? So the main takeaway here from this slide is there is the are, there are these sticker prices Nick referenced it and said it's very expensive. The most expensive schools are topping out at $90,000. I don't say that to scare you. I say that to say that all of these schools are discounting their sticker price, their cost of attendance, whatever you want to call it. It just depends on how they do it. And they do it in one of three ways, not one of, but three different ways. And it could be for many families, it's more than one of these on the slide. So the first way they do it is need-based grant. So as the name is hinting, you have to have financial need in, in the college's eyes. And well, I'll talk about that in a minute. And if you do, they will give you endowment money. You can also get money from the federal government if you have need. And you can also get money from the state. So it's not just the endowments. But I will tell you the best source of these discounts is college endowments, not private scholarships. You, that's a big buzzword, I know, for parents and the people that market these have done a phenomenal job because people think that's the name of the game. It really isn't. Understanding what we're teaching you tonight and getting that endowment money instead of it coming out of your savings and your portfolio, that's the name of the game. So that first bucket is need-based grants. So that's free money 
based on financial need. The second bucket is merit-based scholarship. So that's the flip side. So your finances are not a part of that decision. It's based on your child. It's based on grades and test scores typically. And with test optional schools, a lot of schools don't require the test scores, right? It could be athletics, music, talent, leadership, whatever that school does. And two, no two schools are exactly the same across the board, which honestly is why College Aid Pro exists and Matt and I make a living doing what we're doing, right? It's, it's not transparent, it's not clear. So that's that second bucket. The third bucket we call self-help. So that's loans and work study. So it's a part of a lot of people's college funding strategies, which is fine in moderation, but obviously loans, you have to pay back and work study, your child gets a job and actually has to work. So that could be part of it, but the first two buckets are what you wanna try and maximize if possible. Okay, so how do you know if you're eligible for need-based aid? How does the college decide that? They, they take their cost of attendance, which is the sticker price, which is tuition and fees, room and board, books, transportation, and personal expenses. Those are the line items. As we all know, this, these, the cost of attendance have been going up for decades, and we have no control over that. So they take their full cost, and they calculate the financial aid forms, help them calculate what's called up till now, it's been called an expected family contribution, EFC for short. Starting with your kid's class, the class of 2024, your kids are going to school the 24-25 school year. That's the first year that these FAFSA changes are going to be implemented that we're going to talk about at the end. One of the changes is they're calling the EFC an SAI, a student aid index. The calculations of what goes into it are changing um, and we'll explain some of those. That's a whole webinar in and of itself, but it's just a name change. So in July, we're going to get rid of VFC. We still have it in there. So if you have an older child or you've been doing some reading, just think of it as the EFC. So they take that number that's calculated from financial aid forms and they just subtract them. And that's your need. So if you have an EFC, if you're looking at your MyCap account right now and you've set it up, you'll see two EFCs up there. And we're going to, Matt's going to highlight that in a few minutes. Um, they take that. So say it's $50,000 and a school costs 80,000. 80 minus 50, you have 30,000 of need. That doesn't mean the college is going to give you $30,000. They'll package this your, your child. That's what we call it. They'll put a financial aid package together. Um, and we'll we'll look at, at some of that in a few minutes. Um, that's how it works. If you are looking at your MyCap dashboard and it says 120,000, well, thank God, no schools cost that yet. You don't have any need, right? Because 80 minus 120,000 is a negative number. So you are not eligible for need-based aid. So that's how the colleges are figuring that out. So the next question is, okay, that's great, Peg, but how do they calculate this EFC slash SAI? So they look at two main things. They look at assets, non-retirement assets, and income. And they look at it for the student as well as the parents. So most kids, unless they're sitting on a trust fund that they're the beneficiary of, they don't have a lot of assets. Parents are usually the ones that have the assets. And you noticed I said non-retirement assets. So if you've been a good saver, and I'm actually a financial planner, financial advisor by background before I started my college planning business and then joined CAP. So I'm delighted if you've been a good saver and you've got some nice balances in your retirement accounts, 401k, IRA, Roth IRA is, is a retirement account, 403b, pensions, all of that, those balances, if you've got 750,000 bucks in a 401k, that's awesome. It's not going to be part of the calculation, but all your other assets that are not retirement are. So that means checking, saving, CDs, bond portfolio, stock portfolio. If you have real estate that's not your primary home, um, that's on the on the table for both forms and all schools. So if you have a cabin in the woods, if you have vacant land that you use for hunting or whatever. The, the equity in that property, meaning the market value minus any liens, a mortgage, a HELOC, that amount 
is considered an asset by the colleges. Um, I'll, in a minute, I'll hit on the home you live in, but I'll just say that in that first bucket, that's all considered non-retirement, it's all included. Five two nines are also part of that bucket as long as you or the student, which I've never seen, the student has as the owner, usually the parent's the owner and your child is the beneficiary. The key thing there is that's an asset of yours as a parent. And the reason is, is because you haven't gifted that money to your child. It's still your money that you could do something else with. You'd pay, you'd pay taxes and a penalty, but that's actually a good thing in financial aid because parent assets are assessed up to 5.64% after allowances whereas student assets are 20 or 25%. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make on financial aid forms. And it makes sense. It's like, well, it's a 529 for my son. So of course it's his asset. It is not. So that's part of this bucket of your asset. So just keep that in mind. That's that's a big one. That's a big one to remember. Um, people will ask us all the time. Like, I, know, I know you love when I butt in here specifically. I know, uh, wait, you want me to just say what you're going to say? Because I just thought of it. <laughs> yeah let's see let's see if you got it go ahead so what matt's gonna say is hey and if you have if your child has a checking account that's in their name you can actually and say it's a sizable amount of money if it has a hundred dollars in it i wouldn't do this right it's not going to move the needle much but if your child i mean i've met some kids that you know they'll have ten thousand dollars because they've had a job and they're doing all this stuff and they're real hustlers you can add your name and, you know, your kids trust you. You're not doing it to take over the account and take the money. Then it becomes an asset of yours. So there's different things you can do like that. Did I hit it? We do this too much, Peggy. We might need a vacation. <laughs> uh, okay. but the, no, you did. But I, but it, it, so it's, I, I just love that example. But to me, it's, 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 an, it's an example of a larger theme, which is, there's a certain amount of things that we just can't control in this process and the rules are what the rules are and things like this, right? There's two things that we can do though. Number one, just understand what those are. So we understand what we're, how this works, right? Not just on a global level, but, or a macro level, I should say, but at each particular college we're thinking about. And then obviously how our family falls on this financial aid spectrum or lack thereof. So that's one, let's, un what can't we control and how does that work? Right. But then for all the things that we can control and the list is larger than we think it is, let's be smart. Right. Let's be strategic. And that's just one example. But when we do all those things the right way, they add up. Right. So. So, again, I think that's like a theme that to me, I always gravitate towards. Right. Like, let's control the controllables. And that would just be a, a good example there. Well, and that's a great segue into the bottom right of this slide. How should we value our home? So. I said that most schools will not look at your the home you live in. We call it your primary home, primary home equity. But there are a group of schools, and I would venture to guess that maybe all of your kids on this webinar might have one of these schools on your list and probably more than one, right? So these schools are going to ask about the home you live in, and you want to make sure that you're being honest, always be honest. But you don't want to overvalue your home. You don't want to put the price that you leave it on the market for that best offer for the person that falls in love with it and wants to give you way over asking, right? You want to get the, the lowest reasonable um, value of your home. And then you can take off 15 to 20%. It's called the IRS quick sale value. As you know, if you sold the home, you don't get all the proceeds, right? You're paying realtors work out in Washington, we pay sales tax when we sell our home, right? So you're not walking away with all of it. So that's, to Matt's point, like that's just another bit of information you don't know if you don't know, right? And it can move the needle. It can move the needle. And we're going to show you some other stuff as well. And then the last piece here about debt, people will always say, well, you know what, Peg, I have credit card debt. I still have student loans. We have car loans. What about that? Well, that's something you're going to be reaching out to the colleges. The colleges, they're really not against you. They're really trying. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of quoting some of our, some of the people that do consults for us with our families that are at MIT and Harvard and, and the guy at Harvard School of Medicine was at BC. And so they've been behind the curtain, if you will, right? They know how these things work and they want to know the family's situation. So if you have a strain on cash flow, 
that's real, a special needs child that's younger, all that stuff. It's not, this is not a time to be shy, right? You want to be honest, like I said, but you want to be open with the schools. So, so this is the asset piece and assets. Just a, are, sorry, just a gentle yeah. reminder. Cause I know we had a bunch of folks that uh, signed on just a little bit after our intros in the beginning. If you could just please put the questions in the Q and A, cause we got a really good question around uh, 529s and should we use that in the, in year one if, if we don't have enough to cover all four years so maybe our EFC is a, or SAI is a little bit lower for year two oftentimes that's a recommended strategy that's not a firm recommendation because that's just kind of one variable but I would say more often than not that's what we would recommend again for most families um but please put any questions in the Q&A and just remember you can be anonymous because everybody can benefit from seeing those questions and answers. And even those that couldn't attend tonight can see kind of that transcription. So again, just a reminder, and I know a bunch of you showed up after we flagged that at the top. Yeah. And I would say too, with that question that um, you want to look and see how much it's going to move the needle, you know, so that that's a hard one to, like Matt said, we can't just answer that across the board without seeing your situation, but that's a great question. Okay, so assets, all of this, when you're going to be reporting this, it's actually the current value of them. So if you, you know, if the market's doing what it's been doing lately and it's a down day and you've got a lot of stock in your portfolio, you could literally pull up the end of day value and that's what you could put on the financial aid form. So very current value of assets. The other flip side is the income and income by far is the biggest driver, parental income. Um, for most people, it's it, it, it's assessed at a much higher rate is the, is the reason. It's like the tax tables in the highest part of your income, it can be assessed almost up to 47%. So it's, it's a lot. It goes off of your adjusted gross income primarily. There are some add-ins, but that's the biggest driver. But unlike assets that are current value, Income is a two-year look back. It's We call it prior, prior year. President Obama put this into place a while ago when he was president, obviously. And so it is, it's a two-year look back. So all of you with a class of 2024 graduate coming up, you're going to be reporting when these forms go live this fall, you're going to be reporting on 2022. It's going to be long gone. Even if you extended, you're probably going to be done, right? So the years you're going to be reporting on over the four years is 22, 23, 24, and 25. So it makes it easier because it used to be the year before and it was it was crazy. It was crazy to get it all done. So just realize that income is what it is, right? Most people, I've had a few parents through the years like, oh, well, maybe I'll, I want to go hike the Pacific Crest Trail, which is out here. I'm like, okay, dude, go for it. And then there was no income, right? But you know what? Most people can't do that, right? So income, and believe me, if you make a nice income, it's better to see how that affects your EFC now. And as Matt said earlier, it's only certain things we can control and making a nice income is a great thing. It's just in the financial aid world, it stings a little, right? But it's it's far better to have the resources and to learn what we're teaching you tonight. So income is that second piece. So income and assets. Students, as it says on here, they have an income um, allowance. It's over $7,000. So for most kids, even if they work throughout the school year, they're probably not making more than that. So it's a wash. Basically, if they made $7,600 is part of the equation, right? If they're sitting on tons of income, yeah, that's a needle, needle mover, but it's usually not the case. So that's how it works for income. So as I said earlier, you're looking at your dashboard, maybe some of you are seeing some pretty high EFCs, right? You're probably thinking, how the heck am I going to pay? I can't afford this. Most parents, that's what they say when they see their EFC and or soon to be SAI, but it just, for a lot of people, it is what it is, right? There's not a lot of wiggle room to change it. Um, so what do you do? Well, Remember my first slide, that middle bucket that said merit scholarship, that's not based on need. So Matt and I, through, through the years, probably 10,000 families between the two of us pretty easily, over half have no need. So that doesn't mean that you're just like, there's nothing I can do. I shouldn't submit any forms. I just have to go through this process. And, you know, because my neighbor told me that it's absolutely not the case because there are 
there are discounts out there for for your child. So I will uh, turn it over to you, Matt, to touch on the merit scholarships. Yeah, and I and I think you know similar to what we were saying around home equity, right? Safe money tells me that you know all of you that are tuning in here are going to apply to at least one school that considers home equity in some capacity, right? Northeastern, BU, uh, Boston College, right? Or Providence, a couple here locally that are that are pretty popular that you guys are probably at least talking about at home, right? And I'd also venture a guess that a, a meaningful percentage of you, you're not going to be eligible for need-based financial aid or not, or not a ton of it, right? Um, and, and I think you know, what we, the, the term we use internally um, for families that are, that we describe as we call them bubble families, right? Where they're not getting need-based financial aid or they're not eligible for, for need-based financial aid, or at least not that much. But it's kind of insane to think that they're in a position to start cutting checks for $90,000 a year, times four years, times three kids or whatever, plus paying for private school and everything else, the cost of living in, in the Boston area, the whole deal, right? That you guys know all too well. So, and, and and these types of families, I think, have some of the biggest challenges in making this whole thing work. Um, and even if you do have some resources or do feel like maybe you could swing these insane sticker prices each year, you, you probably just don't want to, right? So, you know, if I'm not eligible for financial aid or I'm not eligible for much financial aid, what can I do to not pay full rack rate, right? What can I do to bring uh, the price down a little bit here? And obviously, the, the, the or I think, obviously, the first thing we all think about is, well, I want to apply to schools where my kid is likely going to get scholarships, and hopefully they're also a good fit for my kid, right? And we'll talk about how you can leverage a platform in just a second here to find out which those uh, which schools fit into that category. And Peg mentioned this in passing a, a second ago here, but a lot of families will make the mistake of assuming, well, I know I'm not going to get need-based financial aid, so I'm not going to complete the FAFSA. So I'm not going to complete the CSS profile. Well, for some colleges, in order to be considered for any types of scholarships, you have to complete those forms, right? And we always use NYU as a good example because they're such a popular college and th they fit that bill, right? You can't, they're not even going to consider you for scholarships unless you complete those forms, regardless of your financial aid eligibility, regardless of how talented your kid might be, right? So we'll, we'll dive into specifics in a second here, but a couple more points I want to hit on quickly for this slide. Uh, and, and, and I'll kind of skip down to the asterisk here. And in, in my experience, this is not necessarily common knowledge, but not every college offers scholarships, right? And that list is growing. It's now about 100 colleges in the country where scholarships don't exist, right? And we got plenty of them in our backyard here, right? Not one Ivy League school offers scholarships, right? And nobody's walking around Harvard uh, on a scholarship, right? If they're not paying full sticker price to go to Harvard, it means they're getting need-based financial aid. And it doesn't matter what type of athlete they are, what type of musician, how intelligent, um, completely irrelevant scholarships don't exist, right? And even at, even at Tufts, for example, right? And most of the NESCAC schools, so Amherst and Williams, Bates, Bowdoin, Colby, right? Scholarships don't exist there. So as we're building this list of schools, it's just important to know that information, right? Because we have enough examples, right, in our experience where we have this incredibly talented kid that's applying to these really competitive, awesome schools, and their family fits this bill where they're not getting need-based financial aid, but there's no way they can pay $90,000 a year, right? Um, so it's important that we at least hedge our bets. And, and again, if we get into Harvard, we'll figure out how to make Harvard happen, right? But but we want to hedge our bets. So, and, and, and again, that's kind of a big part of... Uh, it fits in that category of, of controlling the controllables, right? So so what are some other awesome schools that are likely to give my kid a, a meaningful discount, right? Um, so that should, we think, should just be a part of the process as you guys are building out that list. And it's like, if we have a shot or, you know, of course, apply to Harvard. And if we go there, if, if we get in, we'll figure it out. But let's not have... 10 schools on the list where scholarships don't exist if we're a family that's, you know, somewhere in the bucket that I'm describing here. 
I'm just going to interject because I can't hold my tongue. Just because you get into Harvard doesn't mean you have to go. You still need to look at, is it, you got to look at the other schools and what you got. I'm, I'm saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So. All right, Peg, we'll take that offline. If you get a goal, if you get a golden ticket, you take your golden ticket. And That's going to benefit. Oh yeah. We got to take this offline. Cause yeah. Yeah. I'm just putting that in there for the, I'm audience. with you. Buddy. So they know there's other. There's other thought process. I hopefully the concept came through, right? Yes, but but yes. the but the it, but the last point here that again we're not going to spend time on tonight, but I like to tease the concept just to make sure that it's somewhere uh, we plant the seed somewhere with you all, you know. And that's the having this kind of mindset a little bit that this is a business transaction of sorts, right? That's not our kind of prevailing thought here, but it's a massive in, investment. That's we can't argue with that, right? And with most other investments that we make, we approach it with a different mentality, right? And we make sure that we create leverage. And if I'm going to buy a home or if I'm going to buy a new car, of course, I'm going to create leverage. Of course, I'm going to negotiate for the best price possible, right? So we just kind of want to, it, it, it's, it's abnormal to bring that mindset to this process. And that's wrong. We should bring that mindset to this process, right? And a part of that is applying to competing schools. Right? I think I mentioned at the top, I went to Stonehill College, and it, it and that's a you know nice little school here locally, and and it's, it's relatively popular, right? For those of us that Harvard was never uh, in play for, right? Where we had to go to, uh, you know, we had to look at plans B and C. But you know, the if if I have a family that wants to go to Stonehill, I make them apply to Bentley, even if they hated Bentley. Because they're direct competitors, and I'm just going to use the Bentley offer to get more money out of Stonehill, right? And vice versa. If they had no interest in Stonehill, love Bentley, I'm going to make them apply to Stonehill, right? So, so you, you that concept that I think is an important one, and especially if we're not eligible for need based aid, that is something we can use to our advantage ten months from now when we're making that final decision, right? Where we can say, yes, I'm not eligible for need based financial aid, but your competitor gave me a ten thousand dollars more in scholarships, so. Uh, again, just want to plant that seed. And Peggy, if I could, I'll share my screen and kind of dive in here. And we can look at, um, let's see. The, so so this is for those of you guys that have set up your account, and I see it's most of you or a good amount of you, which is great. Um, this is kind of your home dashboard, right? This is this is what you're looking at after you, you know, create your account, your username and password. And again, the, the link is mycap.collegeaidpro.com. The first thing that we'll ask is for you to, again, create that username and password. And then we'll ask kind of what option you want to sign up for. You want to choose that middle option, the scholar option, the one that says it's $149, right? When you select that, it'll prompt you for the coupon code. And at that point, you put, put, in, put in the Pingree24 coupon code, and it'll zero that out, right? Um, and if by some chance you already set it up and you pick the free version, then up and up here where it says talk to an expert, it's going to say upgrade. Right. So just click upgrade. Scholar option will be there again and go ahead and, and put in your code there. Exactly. So a couple of things I, I want to point out here quickly, you know, to further complicate matters. There's actually more than one EFC, right? And there's going to be two EFCs next year. So you can kind of ignore this part of the platform. Those will be part of this new FAFSA rule overhaul, which will go live uh, on our end around, uh, we're pegging July 15th. So if it's not there exactly, it'll be pretty close. But there's a couple different EFCs. And, and like Peg mentioned, uh, it can often be a drastic difference, right? Because these schools, uh, the schools that use the federal EFC, soon to be SAI, they don't consider home equity, for example. They're not even going to ask you if you're a homeowner at all on the FAFSA, right? So that's one less asset if we are a homeowner that's not considered. They're also, if you are a divorced or separated, if you're a two-household family, they're only going to be looking at one household's income and assets, et cetera, when determining that family's EFC, right? Now, this is, a, a, I think, kind of a good um, example family because, and this is a, a, a Beverly family because, number one, they're homeowners. They own their primary residence. And number two, this is a divorce family. So it's two households. And schools that use what's called the institutional EFC, 
And there's different variations within that bucket. Number one, if you're a two household family, they're going to be looking at the information, most of these schools of both households, right? So usually that means more income and more assets to assess in determining your, your need-based financial aid eligibility. And the other thing is, again, to varying degrees, they're usually looking at home equity. So that's why in this case, this EFC at these institutionally at these institutional schools is is significantly higher, right, than the federal EFC schools. So that's really more than you need to know. Hopefully, the education and context is a little bit helpful, uh, and I hope without being too overwhelming here. But as you guys are just starting to get curious about what colleges are actually going to cost you, I just want you focused on the net cost, right? And again, this this is a pretty good example, and it's not crazy. Like we see this way more than you would expect where for this family, it's going to be more affordable to go to, um, to go to Amherst college than it is to go to UMass Amherst. Right. And, and again, that is not wildly, uh, that's not weird, right. That, that, that is not like a crazy anomaly of a family that, that works out that way. We see that way more often than you would think. And Penn State's a great example where, you know, I know a lot of families that are really conscious about, about the price point of this thing and the affordability is they're saying, well, listen, you can only apply to state schools. Forget about Amherst, forget about NYU, and these schools are going to be, you know, $90,000 or whatever. Well, state schools, especially if they're out of state, they're still pretty stinking expensive. And they just do very little to nothing in the way of giving money. So uh, that's not necessarily a strategy for being eligible for more financial aid, right? And, and I think it's always helpful to look at some examples, and then we can kind of drill down on them and see how they do in terms of uh, merit and need-based financial aid. So if you guys want, just throw a couple of colleges in the chat, right, or the chat or the Q&A, it doesn't matter, that you guys are talking about at home, or, or maybe it's your alma mater, or your you know, maybe there's a top choice already, or you're going to visit or have visited a couple colleges, throw some of them out there for us. And, and we'll just kind of look at a couple of these or at least one as a case study, and we can kind of see how they do. Okay, so I saw Vassar as an example here, right? So Vassar is a school that's really good with need based financial aid. And, and again, if we want to kind of drill down more as to the why we can do that. So I can click on Vassar again, any any of the colleges that that you might put in here. And we can see, well, why are we not paying full sticker price here? Well, we saw our EFCs on the first page. Okay, and we see that we're going to be eligible for need based grants here. And again, if we want some more context into the why, we can click on this financial aid tab and say, Okay, well, here's what methodology they use. And here's the percentage of need that they meet. So basically, they meet 100% of need. So whatever our EFC is at, according to this school, that's what we're going to pay, right? And the, the other thing here is that basically, what this is telling us, and and uh, is that they don't give merit-based scholarships, right? And 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 again, if we want some context, we don't pretend to be. Um, experts in this platform in terms of, or and 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 we certainly don't pretend to give any any indication as to whether your kid's going to get in or not but we have some averages baked in here just to have a, a kind of convenient i guess uh kind of point of of reference here to say well here's the average test gear scores here's the average gpa here so you can get an idea of you know where your kid um might stack up and let me just check out a couple other schools here. So I see, okay. So let's see, um, let's, let's look at Lehigh will be a decent one. Okay, so Lehigh is one that again, pretty good in terms of need-based financial aid, but different than Vassar, most significantly, and this is just baked into the platform, you know, even though it's a, a similar type of school, you know, very expensive, very generous with need-based financial aid, but they consider home equity, right, with much more emphasis than than Ambassador does, for example. So that's why, you know, we're paying a lot more here. And, you know, scholarships do exist at this school, but they're unbelievably competitive, right? So, you know, in most cases, uh, we are not going to project 
that the student's going to be eligible for for any you know merit based scholarships. But but they're but they are listed down there below where Matt was scrolling. So if you have a student that I'm just making this up, got a 30 on the ACT, it's not projecting anything, but you see, oh, if I get to my child gets a 32, wow, then they could be eligible for a dean scholarship or whatever. Um, that helps you do some planning around, hey, maybe it's worth to throw a couple bucks to some test prep and do a little tutoring or whatever. All of that, it, it helps you kind of plan for all yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's a good call, right? Because you can fool around with, you know, as you onboard yourself and we're asking for, you know, GPA and test scores and income estimates. If you want to make any changes at any time, you can go up and hit this profile button and it'll kind of update your EFCs in real time update your scholarship projections, right? So to Peg's point, if if your first test was a, you know, 24 in the ACT, you could be like, well, what if we went to a 27? For the schools we're looking at, is that enough to move the needle in terms of scholarship projections? And, and, and you can feel, again, this will never be a perfect platform, we'll never be perfect with our projections, but you can feel pretty good. Uh, you can have a, a, a you know, a, I think a really reasonable amount of confidence in what we're projecting uh, here. So, so again, that can help make some of these decisions. Is it worth it to pay for, you know, um, those types of things, right? Could we get a return on that investment? So uh, this is a, a, a part of the uh, platform I want to show you quickly. And again, I don't want to hog too much time here, but uh, I think this is an important one that as you guys, again, are balancing out that list, and I know it always starts with where, where do we want to go? What's going to be the best fit for our kid? And then it goes to kind of, okay, let's think about the affordability piece, or let's think about where we can hedge our bets. This is a great way to do it. So if I go to this advanced school search, I can say, hey, go show me schools that are relatively close to my house and maybe they're you know I know my kid and they're going to be more comfortable at a smaller school and as of today they're thinking about majoring in bio right and you don't have to have a major or anything like that and you can put in any number of criteria but then we can just kind of rank order them based on you know what where is my kid most likely to receive for example, and the, the the one I chose is merit-based scholarships based on that, right? So maybe, you know, Wheaton College down on the South Shore was never on our radar, but we are kind of drawn to these smaller liberal arts type colleges in the Northeast. And that's interesting. They're likely to give us a $40,000 discount regardless of our income. Maybe it's worth a visit or at the very least kind of taking a closer look on their website, right? And if we are eligible for financial aid, we can sort just based on that. Right. So so this can give us some ideas of, of, of colleges that, um, you know, fit that criteria that's important to us, but are, um, you know, really generous with need based financial aid. So, again, I, I that's a part of the platform, I think, that we're um, especially proud of that 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 should be a, a great resource as you guys are, are building out and finalizing that school list. All right. So as we shared at the beginning, you're going to get the slides. So there's a couple more slides here that have some info about merit. So you will be able to review that stuff at your leisure. So let's get into what's going to happen this fall. So that's when the financial aid forms go live. So just like on the admission side and just like in high school, there's deadlines. Papers need to be handed in at a certain time to get a good grade, yada, yada, right? Same thing here, right? There's there's admission application deadlines. There's what we call priority financial aid form deadlines. So it's important for you as you as a family to figure out how you're going to stay on top of this, right? Every family might handle this differently. Um, good for your kids to get responsible and have to keep track of stuff, right? They're going to have to do it all on their own when they go to college. So definitely be on top of deadlines and all the requirements. And and it's. It's not the college's job to be spoon feeding this. They will communicate. Sometimes they only communicate with the student. So make sure if they're communicating via email that your kids are looking at their email. I know mine are a little bit older and they are just like, mom, don't email me, you know, text me this or that, right? But if, if that's how they're doing it, they gotta be on top of it and forward you things that they don't understand, whatever it happens to be. So just keep that in mind. Um, as Matt said earlier, almost every school in the country 
requires the FAFSA. There's a second form that I'm going to touch on in a minute called the CSS profile um, that will be submitted with the FAFSA, not in lieu of it. And all these schools are a little different. There's even some schools that have their own financial aid form, right? As I said earlier, that's why we exist, right? It's it's kind of a confusing process. So this is, you know, there's the whole admissions piece and what do they require and what are the deadlines? And then there's the corresponding financial aid piece. So just keep that in mind. They're not the same. They are linked in that the way you apply for admission is going to be linked to those deadlines. So we've mentioned the FAFSA a few times. That probably sounds familiar to a lot of you. That's the free application for federal student aid. Most colleges, it's the only form you're going to submit. And that's the way the college is going to give out federal aid, state aid, and their institutional aid, meaning their endowment money. Usually the FAFSA goes live October 1st because of these changes that I mentioned earlier that Matt's going to touch on in a few minutes. They're still the Department of Ed is still trying to get that all in place for this one year only. It's going to go live in December. And that's all they've told us. A couple months ago, they said it's going to go live in December. We're hoping for December 1, but we don't know. The minute we know, we will blast that out through our social media channels and our email to our whole CAP community to, to let you know. So whatever date that is, that's when it's going to go live. Um, this other stuff, the prior prior year in two, 2022 being your base year, meaning the income year you're going to report on, I've already talked about. And then Matt mentioned that when you're submitting the FAFSA, only the custodial parent submits it with the student. So it's the student's FAFSA. Remember that. It's not yours. You're e-signing it, but it's really your child's FAFSA. So the definition of the custodial parent is part of these changes. So if you're a divorced or separated family, up until now, in case you have an older child, it's been where the child literally slept the most nights. It doesn't matter what's in a divorce agreement or anything. That was the custodial parent. So it was easy for parents that live local, both, to have the child stay wherever the parent that was more advantageous to report for financial aid. And that was being honest and just taking advantage of that loophole. So what Congress did is now the definition is the parent that provides the most financial support. So still not completely clear because it's not just whoever paid child support, right? You really want to get out a spreadsheet and detail each person and what they're contributing to support your child. And it might be that the per if, if the child spends more time with a certain parent that has a mortgage and pays utilities and pays for elite soccer and music and da 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 da, da right? That could end up being more than maybe the parent who doesn't, the child sees them every other weekend and is paying child support. So just keep that in mind. It's still a planning opportunity and there still are options. You wanna be honest, of course, but that's how it's gonna work. The other parent is not, that non-custodial parent is not involved at all. And it's not for all four years. This is gonna, this is assessed every year. So if things change, then there could be another parent submitting. Um, you also need to get what's called a federal student aid ID. This is used to electronically sign the FAFSA. You see the link on the slide here. Your child will get one and whichever parent is submitting it. And if you're married, who's ever kind of owning that part of the process? In my household, it was me, right? So I got one. You, you The IRS, basically, they're just verifying you are who you are. You're going to tell them your social and your date of birth, they're going to check you out. You create a username and password and security questions. Um, we've heard, and we haven't seen anything official, that this process is going to change and might get a little bit harder, uh, more arduous. We'll see. That's the link right now. But I always tell people, don't wait till the last minute to do it. You got enough on your plate and you don't want it to hold up submitting it if you've got a deadline looming. But you do need to do that. And then keep that in a safe place because you're going to need it every year when you submit the FAFSA. So that's how that works on the FAFSA. And we are, you're gonna get this deck. We're not gonna get in the weeds on these mistakes. Um, we we've touched on a couple already, but you can review that. And in the fall, we're gonna do a line by line where we'll take you through these forms and we'll hit 
all the areas of what you, you know, you want to be careful and, and answer questions correctly. So the second form is called the CSS profile. So again, this is about, it's, it's, it's a over 200, right? Mostly private schools like Michigan and UVA, William and Mary, UNC Chapel Hill are in there, but most of them are private. And so this is, is submitted along with the FAFSA, not in lieu of it. And as we've mentioned, the, a big difference on here is that your primary home, the home you live in, is going to be asked about. And some colleges will actually have the audacity to include all of your equity. If it's worth a million and you owe 400,000 in a mortgage, they could say, yeah, that 600 is like a liquid asset, which no bank would let you tap it. That's a whole nother conversation, but that's appealable, right? But just realize that's part of this equation and don't overvalue your home when they're asking you the market value. That's a whole strategizing conversation in and of itself. The CSS profile is much longer than the FAFSA and much more invasive. It's it's pretty much turning over every rock, but there is, there is a smart way to submit it and we will teach you that. So um, you don't have to answer every question. So that's, that's for the fall. This form goes live October 1, just like the FAFSA usually does. And it usually goes live the end of September, I'll just tell you. So if you're a real go-getter, you can go look it up and see if it's live. You're looking for the 2425 profile is what you're looking for. Um, that is still, we have heard nothing that that's going to change. And I would be shocked if it changes because a lot of schools need that and they want to move forward for their early decision kids and everything. Um, we had a question and I, I said I was going to answer it. And here we go. I'm answering it. For divorced and separated families, both parents are going to be sending this in separately. So the custodial parent will send it with the student. The non-custodial parent will send what's called a non-custodial CSS profile. It stays private. The college sees both of them, obviously, but the parents don't see it. And it, it's um, one thing I, I wanted to mention about the FAFSA too. If you're remarried and you're the custodial parent, you're going to be submitting the household income. But remember, the non-custodial parent will not be included. And this is also for separated families. So if you are not living in the same household, but, but you are separated, but you're not officially divorced, that's okay. You just can't be living. I've had people that are literally, if you're in the same household, you're stuck. Even if one's in the basement and you hate each other and you never talk to each other. I've had this, right? If you're in the same house, you really are still considered married. So, um, and then the last piece here, business owners, just, I'm just going to touch on if you are a business owner, they are going to look closely at your business or businesses, meaning they're going to ask all the, all the CSS schools after you submit, you send your 1040, your W2s, your 1099s, your 1120S if you have an S Corp. They're going to look at all of that and they like to dig and see, oh, that's an expense for the IRS, but we don't really think so. We're going to throw it out. So all of these things are appealable. And if you're if you get guidance from somebody who knows kind of what they do, which is what we do a lot to say, hey, you know, you can appeal on these items and this is how you should do it. It can it can really mean tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're a business owner on the FAFSA up until now, if you had a small business, less than 100 full time employees, that was that was family owned the value of that business was off the table. That's no longer the case for your, your FAFSA this fall. So keep that in mind if you're a business owner. You still might have a business value of zero. If you're a consultant and God forbid you get hit by a bus, your, your, your business has no value, it could be zero. So don't, don't feel like you're doing something wrong if you don't put a big number there. Um, but we'll talk about that in the fall as well. So that's the CSS profile, some more um, tips and tricks there on filling it out, but we'll hit that in the fall as well. So Matt, I will let you take over here to touch on the changes. Yeah, and and and, and again, it just, just to reiterate, we'll come back when you guys are kind of officially at game time uh, after the summer, and it's really time to start actually executing, completing, submitting these financial aid applications. And some of these things that are still unknown according to the colleges themselves, right? These are conversations we're having every day. Uh, we'll have that um, 
uh, most of those, uh, there should be a bow on most of that stuff, but there's some things we do know right now. Right. And, and that you, you class 2024, you guys are the guinea pigs for these new FAFSA changes. And they're really the most significant changes kind of in this system overall in decades. Um, anyways, there's some good ones, right. And, and, uh, Nick Peg and myself were talking on these, uh, briefly before we, went live tonight but i mean the, the big win here is that the families that need the most help are getting more help right the application process itself is becoming way less cumbersome right so this fafsa application at least for the fafsa that is currently 100 plus questions is going down to about 35 so the the um and the spirit of that is a really good one because it's like hey especially for these folks where you know, English is a, is a second language is, is a huge challenge, or maybe it's these students that are getting little to no help at home. We have to make sure that they can at least complete and submit this application, right? So, so those are huge wins. The problem is it's not the federal government or any other entity that's going to be kind of financing or funding uh, those programs and funding those wins it's going to be other families, right? And the three biggest buckets of families that are going to be uh, funding that, number one, Peg just mentioned it, small business owners, right? It used to be that if you had less than 100 employees, anything to do with your business is not considered on the FAFSA. It's not going to have any impact on your need-based financial aid eligibility. That's going away, right? That's going to be a challenge. These divorced and separated families, right? Now, the the and I know the federal government's thought process is, well, if we make the uh, we are assuming that the in most families, the parent that provides the most financial support is the one with the most resources, the highest income, et cetera. That's going to give those families a higher EFC, right? They're going to pay more for college and, and, and be eligible for less discounts. And the biggest one, the most glaring one, I think the most egregious one, and that's a I could make an argument for probably 83, are these families that have more than one kid in school at once, right? And I know we got that question earlier in the presentation, and I probably delivered that bad news to whatever parent asked that where that's always been taken into consideration where where the rule basically states that if you're a family that has this income and this uh and these assets well we're going to give you the efc based on that for one kid and if the next year you have two kids in college we'll chop it in half and each kid will have half of your total efc for that family right whereas now that's going away so effectively for a meaningful amount of, of families, the EFC is going to double and the cost of college could double in some cases at some colleges. So uh, so that's a huge problem. It's not going to happen at most of these schools that use the institutional uh, methodology. Plenty of them have not decided yet, but you know the Harvards, MITs, et cetera, are definitely still keeping the uh, sibling discount. And usually they have an influence on everybody that wants to be those institutions. So the expectation is, and, and again, we're, we're all over this, is that most of those schools are going to keep it. But if Peggy, if, if you would go to the next slide here, what we're trying to do is do everything that we can to control, prevent this sibling discount from going through. It's been kind of a beast of an effort behind the scenes here. Um, and we, we we started this petition over a year ago. We got 67,000 signatures thereabouts. We've tried hard to get in front of decision makers, but they're basically like, until you get 100,000 signatures, there's nothing we can do for you. So go out there and good luck. Um, so that's why anybody that we get in front of that has any skin in the game with this thing, we ask that they please sign it. They please share it. If they're open to that, it takes 30 seconds. And Peg just put the link in the chat there. So help yourselves, help your colleagues, help us. Uh, and that's kind of all we can do in terms of uh, best efforts to preventing this, you know, what I think is a stupid rule um, from going through, to, to put it frankly. Um, and Peggy, if you would, if you can just share that last slide for two seconds and I'll share my screen before I hand it back to Nick. But again, this is more just a, a teaser for for next year, right? But I just, uh, I think it's important to have in the uh, back of your mind somewhere, which in the concept is the only takeaway from this tonight is just like, hey, once you get accepted into these schools and you get that initial financial offer, it's presented as a take it or leave it, but that's not necessarily the case. There are times 
uh, many times in which we can go back and do better than that first offer. And there's a whole method to the madness that we're not going to unpack tonight, but just kind of know that because again, in our experience, it's not necessarily uh, common knowledge uh, for everybody just yet. Um, so I'll let you share, but I just put this up and you guys will get this link of what Matt's about to share, but really I'll let him take it away. But really my, my, my ask of you is keep the ball rolling, stay Stay involved with what we're presenting to you, because as I said earlier, really parent to parent, someone who's been through it, the more you know, when you go on those visits, you'll know what to ask admissions, you'll know what to ask financial aid, because they'll share stuff, and it's true, but it's not applicable to you necessarily, and you hear it and think, wow, that's what the average kid pays, that's affordable, but it's not, that's not the case for your family, so you just but you'll know that the more you learn, and I and I would venture to guess that most of you have learned quite a bit tonight, and hopefully we haven't overwhelmed you, because um, that's we know it's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we're so used to it, but it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. So you know, stay with us, stay on the journey. And Matt's about to share share something. We've got more free resources, so I'll let you explain all that. Matt. Yeah, just double down on it. I mean, I think it's just like, just stay engaged in whatever capacity, right? Don't do what I would do, which is just put my head in the sand until the last possible second, right? Which I think is most people's strategies. It's certainly mine, but, but, but. It's so imagine I'm... working with him. Imagine what I deal with <laughs> on a daily basis. But the, yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> it, it doesn't make it the right one. Um, but yeah, so, so like I said, we'll send you the slide deck. We'll send you the, um, make sure that you, you understand how to get on the platform and, 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 and know where to follow along with us from here. Right. So it'll all be baked in there. I mean, take advantage of all of our free resources. We got a really robust library on YouTube. We do these office hours every other Monday night. So next Monday, seven Eastern time, there's two of us that just kind of hang out in this capacity and like, what are your questions, right? Bring your grab bag of questions. We'll usually talk about what's topical, but it's much more just an open-ended form. And I think a great way to that, as these questions are coming up to your house, you can just you know, have a sounding board. You have somebody to, to go to there. You know, our Facebook group is moderated by folks on our team that have a ton of experience. So again, it's usually a good place to go to, to get pretty quick answers. They're in there Monday through Friday, um, business hours and, and, and beyond. So it's usually you can go there to get a pretty, a pretty quick answer. If you need more help beyond what we offer already, and again, I think Pingree's got you covered for the, for the lion's share of it here, but you can always book an hour with anybody on our team if you're like, I want to talk in a more, I have more questions that, that, that I want to ask than just what you have to offer. You can always do that. You can do it right through your platform. It'll just say it there if you ever want to do that. And for those of you that are just, you know who you are and you're just not a DIYer at all and you, and you, and you just want someone to work with in a more comprehensive way, Again, you can, you, you, we'll send you the follow up and you'll know what that, um, what that looks like for, for again, anybody that, that that applies to. Um, but I think that's it for us. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing I'll say, and Matt says this a lot too. And I, I know from personal experience, I mean, you got a year, right? A year from now, you're going to start realizing, wow, my kids are leaving in a couple months, starting their next chapter. So, I would say try and enjoy it. It's a it's a big year. There's a lot going on, but try and try and uh, smell the roses. Spend time with your kids and uh, enjoy the year because it'll go by fast. It's all about it. Yep. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Peg and Matt, for the presentation tonight. Uh, I'm, I I really appreciate all your expertise and information. I'm mindful of the time. It's 8.05. We got to walk our dogs and then we got a Celtics game at 8.30. So um, I want to get folks ready for that. Know that um, the College Aid Pro tool is really, really useful. Poke around on there. You can you can do all kinds of searches and really get a lay of the land. And also know that the Pingree College Counseling Team is always available for, for questions that come up along the way. Thank you again, Peg and Matt. Um, and thanks to all the parents who joined us tonight. Good night, everybody. Thank Have you. Have a good night, everybody. Night.